Hello and welcome to online worship from the Two Rivers Benefice in Essex for Sunday the 5th of September 2021. Thank you for joining us this week. It's wonderful to have you with us worshipping in this way. As we go through the service there is something for all the family and all the words you need will be shown on the screen. The words that we say together are shown in yellow type. And so let's begin. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We can trust God. God is like the mountain, rock solid. God loves all the people. The poor, the disabled, the outcast, the stranger. We can depend on God. God feeds the hungry, heals the sick and restores relationships. Praise our loving God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And so let's praise our loving God now with our first hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. 
for letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. And so the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we now say together the special prayer for this Sunday. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we trust in your mercy and know your love, rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now for our children's story time, we have a think about God's story. What is the good news of God's story? God's story, the good news. So part of God's story is about the gospel or the good news. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God made everything. The sun, the moon, stars, planets, the entire galaxy. And earth was part of that creation. God made mountains and oceans and forests and deserts and animals that crawled on the ground and flew in the air and swam in the water. Then he made people. Adam and Eve to live in a garden called Eden, and God called everything he had made good. There was just one rule. Adam and Eve could eat anything they wanted except for the fruit from this one tree. But a snake tricked Adam and Eve into disobeying that one rule. Because of that, sickness, sadness, and all kinds of bad things came into God's perfect creation, all because people made wrong choices. Part of how God punished Adam and Eve was by not allowing them in the perfect garden anymore. And if that were the end of the story, that would be bad news for us. That would mean all the wrong stuff in the world would never be made right. But God still loved people, and he had good news for them. He was going to send a rescuer. So they waited, and waited, and waited. Then one day, the rescuer was born as a baby named Jesus. Christmas is when we celebrate the good news of Jesus being born. But it's not just that he was born, it's what he did later that was the best news of all. He took the punishment for all the wrong choices that anyone has ever made anywhere. See, all of us have continued to make wrong choices, just like Adam and Eve did. And just like Adam and Eve, we deserve to be punished for our wrong choices. But here's the thing, Jesus the Rescuer never made a single bad choice. Kids, think about a time you made a bad choice. Maybe telling a lie, or taking something that wasn't yours, or hurting another person with something you did or said. Can you believe that whatever that was, Jesus never made a choice like that? And even though he never made a bad choice, he still took the punishment for our wrong choices? And then Jesus did something even more completely unexpected. He came back to life. Really, you can read about it in the Bible, in the stories written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call those books Gospels, which is just an old fancy word for, you guessed it, the good news of Jesus coming to earth, dying for our wrong choices, and coming back to life. That's what we celebrate on Easter. But not just because coming back to life is totally amazing. By coming back to life, Jesus was showing that God can make anything new. There's nothing God can't do. He's more powerful than any sadness, shame, wrong choice, disease, disaster, and even death. And that's the best, most amazing good news of all. It's so amazing, Jesus' friends told everyone they could find about the good news. And those people told other people. And those people told other people. And on and on. And that's still happening today. In fact, you just heard the good news. And the Bible says, <clears throat> If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's another way to say God rescues us. 
And that rescue includes you, your friends, your family, and anyone else in the whole world. And that's the story of the good news. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made a perfect world. People made mistakes and the world isn't perfect anymore. God promised his family a rescuer. The rescuer's name is Jesus. Jesus died to take a punishment we deserve, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus came back to life because Jesus can make anything new. And that's a part of God's story. And so we've there been reminded about what the good news is. And now for our children's time to sing, we're going to sing about it. The song, Good News. Today's reading is from James 2, verses 1 to 10 and 14 to 17. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin 
and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Judy. And so let's now respond to that first reading by singing again. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Today's reading is from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 37. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit 
came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epaphatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosed and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a night! What a crowd! Makes you glad! Makes you proud of the creme de la creme! Watching us, and watching them! Three months of relief! Of delight! Of Elysian peace! No more notes. No more gold. Here's a health. Here's a toast to a prosperous year. To our friends who are here. And they are spreading burdens ever fading. What a blessed release. And what a masquerade. Well, I hope you enjoyed that short clip of the song Masquerade from the musical Phantom of the Opera. And that song appears when the arrogant aristocrats throw a masked ball to show off their wealth and indulgence with no idea how tragically their story will end. Now I don't know if you heard it but the crowning line of that song which was contained in that clip says all the creme de la creme watching us watching them all the creme de la creme watching us watching them and in our first reading today, James spoke to us about favouritism. All the creme de la creme watching us, watching them. But why is it showing favouritism is such a universal urge? Why do we immediately resonate with James's words? I mean, there are parts of James's letter that might be difficult to understand, but this hypothetical scenario really hits home to all of us, doesn't it? We've all been there, haven't we? And so, what's the cure to this sickness of favouritism that squanders our energy and poisons our relationships? Well, the antidote to favouritism, as James lays it out for us, is a matter of three things. They are insight, implementation and integration. And so firstly, we must have insight. It's easy to be less than sympathetic to the ancient audience this letter was first sent to. We wag our fingers and judge them as ignorant, immature communities of a darker age. Favouritism? Surely we've evolved beyond that, haven't we? <laughs> but let's pause for a minute and look at this audience sympathetically. Favouritism in their age wasn't just bad manners, it could be a matter of survival. 
Life in the ancient world, as Thomas Hobbes described it, was nasty, brutish and short. Poverty was rampant, leaders were corrupt and the common cold could kill you. Favouritism towards the wealthy was a way to get a better job and socially promote yourself and your family. Picking the right people could be the difference between making a living and going hungry. It was much more complicated than all the creme de la creme watching us, watching them. Favouritism to them wasn't simply the self-focused rudeness we might think of when we hear the word today. Yet, even in these desperate circumstances, James tells them that God's people do not practice favouritism. He calls them to the ongoing everyday revolution of bringing God's kingdom into the world. Even in our sophisticated age, favouritism is still a real thing. When you're young, you're, you're vying for popularity, aren't you? When you're an adult, you're networking. We're making those connections, whether you're hoping for a good seat in the restaurant or a nice corner office. But perhaps these manoeuvres aren't a matter of physical survival, but they can become just as vicious and hurtful. Ask the teenage girl who's banished by her friends because she puts on weight. Ask the low-level worker who can't afford to go to the golf day and rub shoulders with the right people. The first verse of today's passage from James said, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Now the Greek term used here for show no favouritism comes from two words. One is face and the other is to be seized by. And so the connotation here is that we're seized by the face of things. We're enthralled with the surface. And James describes the surface details in this passage, contrasting a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes. These are the appearances that seize us and where we need to pray for insight to see through them. James calls us to see others beyond what they can do for us. He preceded this passage with defining true religion, part of which is looking after orphans and widows. These are two people groups, especially in those days, who could do nothing for you. They are the most disenfranchised people in that society. They thoroughly don't matter. But of course, they matter to God and we need insight to see that. We need insight to see that our identities are much higher and deeper than just these surface details that seize us so easily. James referred to orphans and widows. Today we might think of Afghan refugees. And so we mustn't forget that the first antidote for favouritism is insight. And the second one James recommends is implementation. In verse 22 of chapter 1 he said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. And this is another important point about the context of James. In ancient times your moral and ethical life was a matter of philosophy and tradition. Religion in the Greco-Roman world wasn't connected to morality at all. The gods didn't particularly care how you treated your fellow humans. They just wanted sacrifices and might give you a plentiful harvest or healthy children if you sacrificed enough. And so one of the issues in the early church was implementation. Understanding that Jesus didn't call you just to change your beliefs, but to transform your whole life. Jesus wasn't just another God to be added to your shelf of gods at home in the hope that he might bless you. The message of the gospel was to clear that shelf and replace it with Jesus alone, the Lord of heaven who is also the Lord of your everyday life. 
And so James confronts us in verses 15 to 17 with the everyday revolution of the gospel. He says, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Jesus just isn't another sign of belief. He is the Lord who wants our heart, not our lip service. And again, here we can find ourselves judging the ancient world. How could they think of faith and ethics as two different categories? It might seem primitive to us, but don't we see this disconnect in our modern world as well? Church might be a social hour we're comfortable in, but outside those walls where are we unkind? Are we judgmental, especially to those outside our church circles? Or do we just simply adopt the moral code going on in the culture around us? Many things which the Bible teaches us are wrong are considered completely acceptable in many cultures today, and I'm sure you can think of some. But these things get in the way of being a light in the world, and they tell lies about God's focus on relationship and loving others as he loves us. And so if the world doesn't see you exemplifying Christ from Monday to Saturday, they won't care what you do with your Sunday mornings. So in this passage on favouritism and in other places, James takes aim at acceptable, everybody does it, sins and calls us to implementation. Now there was a practice in the early church which we could learn from today. When a church member arrived at church to worship, they were shown to their seat by an usher or we might say a, a welcomer or a church warden or a sides person. But when a stranger arrived, particularly a poor stranger, the bishop himself left his chair and welcomed the newcomer. When the stranger arrived, especially the poor stranger who could give nothing in return, they were welcomed by the highest ranking person there. I wonder, do we implement the gospel in this way? And so the antidote for favouritism also involves implementation. And finally, we must practice integration. One of the striking aspects of the scenario that James presents us here is its intimacy. The rich man and the contrasting poor man are coming to your meeting. These people are right there at your elbow. They're standing next to you over coffee. This isn't just James telling us to avoid judging people we see on the streets or on our televisions. These are people who are right there, breathing our air and standing alongside us. To love people in the abstract is completely different to the hard work of welcoming them. The obnoxious child jockeying for your attention, the dementia patient telling you the same story yet again. These are the shabby clothes that Christ arrives in. And to show this kind of radical welcome, we need to experience integration. And this is a strong theme for James, as we find in James chapter 1 verse 4, which says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And that word there for complete is the word teleos in Greek, and that appears seven times in James's letter. It's not talking about moral perfection as much as referring to wholeness, an integrated person whose actions reflect the values and morals of the Jesus they claim to believe in. The integrated whole person is someone whose identity is completely reflected in their actions. James knows that most people don't live what would be called evil lives, but rather they live fragmented lives. 
Now we might aspire to the brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity, maybe even read books about it, but still only share fellowship with those who look and act the same way that we do. We might be deeply moved as we think about ethical excellence in all we do, but still close shady deals or hide commissions when it comes to real life. On Sunday morning, we might hear a sermon about love. On Sunday night, we might treat a homeless person like they're invisible because they should just go and get a job. We live so much of our life fragmented, believing one thing and showing another by our actions, something sometimes without even being aware of it. Do we live our lives as loved people who don't need the approval of the rich man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes? Do we live out our belief that God loves and speaks through all people when the poor man in filthy old clothes turns up? Do we trust that when we welcome those Christ welcomes, that he will take care of us? That no time is wasted when we walk as he walks and welcome who he welcomes? The integrated whole person sees no dis disconnect between their beliefs and their attitudes and actions. All the creme de la creme watching us, watching them. It sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Trying to keep up appearances when your looks are fading. Trying to exude confidence when you're scared to death. This is the vicious trap of the fragmented life. And so James gives us the antidote to the relational poison of favoritism. He gives us insight, looking beyond the surface of things to the greater kingdom realities at stake. He gives us implementation, putting actions to our words and beliefs, letting your Monday through to Saturday look like your Sunday morning. And he gives us integration, whole, loved and trusting people who welcome anyone with the strength Christ gives them, eager for God's new adventure with every relationship. The poet Gerard Mandy Hopkins said it well. He said, Christ plays in 10,000 places. We never know when he'll arrive or what shabby clothes he might be wearing. But when he does, make sure that you open the door. Amen. Let us now respond by affirming our faith together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the reading of James, we are taught to love thy neighbour as we would love ourselves. In this command, Jesus is saying that to treat everyone the same is not always enough. Every person has been uniquely made and the Lord has placed us all on our own unique path. So sometimes it's not just about helping others out. There's a phrase, give a man some food and he'll feed his family tonight, but give him the means to grow his own food and he feeds his family for life. 
It's about giving the person the right platform to be heard, giving them the means to champion their cause, giving them what they actually need, not what we think they desire. It's not an easy ask of us, but with God and through God, we can help others to be the best version of themselves as God intended. And so we pray on some of the world issues. And as we do, we ask you, Lord, what can we do when we see others challenged by war, regimes, climate change, educational needs, disability and loss? We turn our attention to the refugee crisis in Afghan. We thank you for those aid workers and armed services who have selflessly worked to support them. We bring to mind the Taliban leaders and pray they honour their word to uphold human needs and seek no revenge. We think of those still travelling, left behind, and the anxious waiting families. Lord, be with them all in the anger, confusion and despair. Lord, help us to enable them to be the person you know they can be. We turn our attention to the communities faced with the consequence of extreme weather, in particular those in Louisiana and the southern US counties. We thank you for the charities and emergency services working around the clock to bring hope. We bring to mind the impact that we have on climate change as we damage this world you've created for us. We think of families without power, water, supplies, and where their livelihoods have been threatened by the loss of goods and even looting. Lord, be with them in their anger, confusion and despair. Lord, help us to enable them to be the person you know they can be. We turn our attention to the schools returning this week. We thank you for the teachers, truly God-given. We think of those students that start a new school or college or university and the challenge of new settings, friends and routine. And we think of those students heading back to another interesting school year where once again they try to adjust to a new normal. We bring to mind those where the school setting is not an easy one. It could be that they have learning needs or are bullied or perhaps don't have the same privileges and resources at home to keep up with the others, with their peers. Lord, be with those students while they grow in knowledge, friendships and life skills. And Lord, help us to enable them to be the person you know they can be. We turn our attention to the Paralympians, who return home as heroes with the abundance of medals. Glory to God indeed. We thank you for their inspirational efforts and we thank you for those that support them we know that more can be done to support those with disabilities and disabilities that are both seen and unseen lord be with them as they be a voice of fairness equality and equity and lord help us to enable them to be the person you know they can be we turn our attention to those that are called to serve their community we thank you for our Queen's example of faithfulness. We thank you for Jonathan, Teresa, Sue, David and Steve. And we thank you of the gift for Elizabeth Ring as she comes back on the team. We bring to mind our Prime Ministers and MPs and other world leaders as they grapple over the issues of refugees, climate change, education and disability. Lord be with those that serve. May they be your example of fairness and truth. And Lord, help us to enable them to be the person you know they can be. We turn our attention to our families and friends. We thank you for surrounding us with loving and gifted people. We thank you for placing us in their lives so that we might do good for them in your name. We think of those that have lost loved ones and who are bereaved. Those that struggle with ill mental health, those with sickness, and those that are challenged with a change in their circumstances. And in a moment of silence, we bring these names to you now, Lord. Lord, be with them in their grief, sadness, anxiety. 
and Lord help us to enable them to be the person you know they can be. Lord enable us, enable us to be brave, proactive and kind so that those that in need benefit from knowing you through our actions and words. And as we ask what we can do, let us hear your response and act. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Let's now share in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
stand beside the broken we must go stepping forward keep us from just singing move us into action we must go Now for our final hymn, we join with the congregation of St Andrew's Cathedral in Glasgow on songs of praise to sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? our closing prayers. As you have been fed, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have been received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing which you have received from the Creator, Christ and the Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen. And so go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. We must go To stand in for the shamed For the cause of his great name We must go We must go Go befriend the lost Carriers of peace at all costs We must go 